In Florida, more than 4 billion gallons of groundwater are consumed every day to meet the needs of agriculture, business, industry, and public water supply. As a result, we're reaching the limit of fresh groundwater we should withdraw from Florida's aquifer system. With a growing population and economy, how will we ensure a reliable supply of water in times to come? Meeting our future needs will require a combination of development of alternative water sources, increased use of reclaimed water, and increased water conservation. Find out next how water conservation can help preserve our current fresh groundwater supply on Florida's Water, Wealth for Our Future. This program is made possible by the following generous contributors. The American Water Works Association, Florida's authoritative resource on safe water. Orange County Utilities, preserving water, life's foundation and by Orlando Utilities Commission, the reliable one. Water, a shared resource essential for life itself. Yet the way water flows so easily from the tap and out into our landscapes, it gives the appearance that its supply is endless, making it easy for us to take it for granted and overuse it. But with tremendous population growth and increasing demand on our water resources in Florida, we are reaching our limits on the amount of groundwater we should be using. Each Florida resident uses an average of 150 gallons of fresh water each day, watering lawns, bathing, cooking, and washing cars, clothes, and dishes. Many people use more than the average 150 gallons per day, showing Floridians use more water overall than residents of any other state except California. The top 11 counties in Florida using the largest amount of fresh water include Miami-Dade, Polk, Orange, Palm Beach, Broward, Collier, Hendry, Escambia, Hillsboro, St. Lucie, and Indian River. With Florida's population projected to increase from 16 million people to approximately 21 million people by the year 2020, demand on our surface and groundwater resources will grow even more, increasing by the year 2020 to approximately 9.1 billion gallons of water per day. The intent of this program is to show you some easy ways that you can use water more efficiently inside and outside your home while still maintaining your quality of life. By taking a few easy steps to lower your water use, you'll be able to more effectively manage your water, sewer, and energy costs while helping to preserve our freshwater resources now and into the future. If we all do our part, we can change Florida's status to being one of the most efficient water users in the United States. Before we can attempt to conserve water effectively in and around our homes, we must understand how the water cycle works and where our water comes from here in Florida. 97% of the Earth's water rests in the sea in the form of salt water, leaving 3% as fresh water. Of that 3% fresh water, 2% is frozen in ice caps, leaving just 1% available for drinking. This available fresh water circulates from the Earth to the atmosphere and back. Millions of gallons of water change place continually in this water cycle, passing easily between solid, liquid, and vapor. Water evaporates from the earth from plants, soil, and water resources such as rivers, streams, lakes, and oceans, and moves into the atmosphere. This water condenses into clouds and falls back to earth in the form of rain, sleet, and snow. This precipitation may be captured in streams, rivers, lakes, or oceans, or it can seep deep down into the ground, percolating into our underground aquifers. Although Florida normally receives between 50 and 53 inches of rainfall each year, depending on the location in the state, little of our rain percolates into the aquifer. Three-fourths of our rainfall either runs into our streams, lakes, and oceans, or evaporates back into the air, leaving only 13 inches of rain available each year to recharge Florida's underground aquifers. 
Only 10% of Florida's public water supply comes from surface waters. Major sources of surface water include Lake Okeechobee, Deer Point Lake, the Caloosahatchee River, and the Hillsborough River. 90% of Florida's public water supply comes from underground resources called aquifers. This underground water system can lie near the ground's surface or deep underground. After being pumped from the aquifer system, water is treated and distributed through underground piping to commercial, industrial, and residential consumers. Water from our aquifer system is limited, yet each day we pump billions of gallons of water from our aquifers. Drawing too much water from our aquifers or over pumping can have negative impacts on our water resources such as lowering lake levels, drying of wetlands, and degrading water quality. Additionally, growth leads to expanded roads and paved surfaces that inhibit recharging of the aquifer. In Florida, more than half of our public water supply is used outside the home to water lawns and gardens. To save our fresh water supply, we must use water wisely in our yards. The good news is, you can use water efficiently and still have a healthy landscape. Barbara Agarwal is a conscientious water user who lives in Orlando. She's reduced her water bill by 60% by creating a water efficient landscape using drought tolerant and native landscape plants. When we moved into this house, it was pretty much all grass, a few trees and some shrubs close up to the house. And so I killed off all the grass and then this gradually started planting. I did a lot of research, focused on native and drought tolerant plants. And it took about a year to put in all the plants and then about another year for everything to get fully established. Put down a very thick mulch layer, which I maintain. And once the plants are established, I have my drought tolerant landscape for life. Grass is often a landscape's largest water user. So to save water, Consider creating smaller areas of grass where children or pets can play and supplementing those areas with more drought tolerant and water wise landscape beds. In Barbara's case, she decided to transform her entire yard to a more water efficient environment. The entire property is almost an acre. In the front there's a very small bit of grass that I was required to keep and then the rest of it is different plant material and beds flowing from one area to the next, lots of color and variety, almost everything flowers, some things in season year round. There's winding paths that go through there to allow you to just mosey around and observe the beauty, see the wildlife. There's a lot of wildlife in this yard, particularly birds and butterflies, because I put a lot of effort into designing it specifically for them. Uh, there's little sitting areas where you can stop and observe, and there's even a little vegetable garden where I make organic produce. To maximize her water use efficiency and minimize wasted water, Barbara has grouped the plants in her yard according to their water needs. Zone 1 in her yard is for high water use plants, Zone 2 is for medium water use plants, and Zone 3 is for drought tolerant and native plants and trees. Her high water use zone is her vegetable garden and makes up only 5% of her yard. The only high water requirement plants I have are the vegetable garden. And again, it's a payoff because you get the organic produce. When my husband built the vegetable garden, he put in the sprinkler head such that there's a valve that you can turn it between spray head or soaker hoses. To date, I've only used the soaker hoses, which have worked wonderfully, really cut down on the water use. Plus, it also cuts down on diseases in the plants and you get a better harvest from it. The medium water use zone in Barbara's yard includes the small patch of grass in the front of her yard the shrubs that came with the house, and her butterfly garden. The medium water use zone makes up only about 15% of her yard and is watered no more than twice a week in accordance with her local water restrictions. Here, irrigation is used to supplement natural water from the rain. Though landscapes require water, there are plants that you can choose for your yard that can save water, such as when you choose the right plant for the right place. When making a plant list for your yard, check printed garden guides available at most retailers or at the University of Florida Extension Office in your county. Also, most local governments and state agencies have information available on their websites. Select plants that are appropriate for your soil and landscape conditions, which will need little or no water once established. 
Indigenous trees and plants growing in their native area require very little supplemental water. There are also some non-native plants that require little water once established when planted in the right soil conditions. You'd be surprised at how many beautiful and robust landscape plants are available that need very little or no water once established. Barbara uses native and drought tolerant plants in her large drought tolerant zone where she really racks up the savings on her water bill. The vast majority of the yard, probably 80 percent, is drought tolerant plants of a huge variety, a combination of Florida native plants and drought tolerant but non-invasive non-native plants and they include African iris, beauty berries, fire spike, porter weed, hollies, magnolias, Indian hawthorns, Mexican firebush, dwarf alters viburnum and many many more. These plants get watered only if we have an extended period of high heat and drought approximately two weeks and then maximum watering will be one time a week after that until the rains begin. By reducing turf areas and planting native and drought tolerant plants that grow well with little irrigation, Barbara's payoffs are many. Uh, the most obvious one is I have very low water bills, maybe 10 to $25 a month except during the couple months a year that I actually do have to put some water down. Um, there's, it's beautiful. It's much more beautiful than the grass. I know I'm doing the right thing. There's a peace of mind factor going on there. I also have no concerns whatsoever that if watering restrictions get worse that I'm going to have a problem because I know my yard is established and beautiful as it is. And there's even a little ego boost. People come up, even delivery people, and just compliment me on my yard all the time and say how beautiful it is. In addition to irrigation systems that spray water above the ground, drip irrigation and micro emitter systems are available that deliver water at ground level at a much lower rate. With these lower volume irrigation alternatives, which are optimal for plant beds, potted plants and vegetable gardens, water goes directly to plant roots and is not blown away by the wind or evaporated by the sun, making them much more water efficient. Drip lines and soaker hoses allow water to drip slowly out of multiple pores, simulating a long, gentle rain, and can be attached to your sprinkler system or to your hose bib. Micro emitters release water at a faster rate than drip lines and soaker hoses, but still conserve water. Current spray heads can be retrofitted with micro emitters for use in plant beds on a separate zone than grass. Barbara uses drip irrigation in her vegetable garden with a soaker hose. She also uses micro emitters attached to her hose bib for her new plant beds and in her potted plants. Along with planting native and drought tolerant plants in your yard, another practice that saves a lot of water is adjusting your water schedule to simply supplement natural rainfall. Barbara keeps her water bill very low by doing just that and letting Mother Nature do the majority of the watering. First thing is I watch the weather every day, see what the weather's going to be, and that kind of gives me an idea if I might need to water or not. I also use a rain gauge, which is very important to really know how much rain you're getting. Um, also, I like to stroll through my yard. It's beautiful and relaxing, and you get to know which plants are a little more sensitive to dry and, and help to tailor your watering that way. Big water savings come when you monitor natural rainfall and control your sprinkler system by hand. But for situations when you must irrigate automatically, a rain sensor is an invaluable tool. Rain sensors and soil moisture sensors will turn off your automatic irrigation system when adequate water has been applied or adequate rain has fallen. How many times have you seen sprinkler systems watering regardless of falling rain around them? This is where a rain sensor is effective. When you do have to water, it's best to irrigate in the early morning or the late part of the day. Never water between 10 a.m. and 4 p.m. when the sun evaporates most of the water you put down. During the growing season, most landscapes only need one to one and a half inches of water a week as rain or supplemental irrigation. One inch of water should penetrate to a depth of about 12 inches, depending on your soil type. Best horticultural practices recommend deep, less frequent watering. So watering once or twice a week is better than watering every day. This helps grass and plants to grow deeper roots, enabling them to make the most of limited water. The use of mulch in your landscape can help reduce your need for watering. Using leaves for mulch is one of the best choices because it eliminates the need to bag those leaves and put them in the landfill. 
Although widely available, cypress mulch is not recommended because cypress are slow-growing native wetland trees often taken at maturity to chip into mulch. Cypress are far more valuable to our environment as trees than as mulch in our landscapes. Other suggested mulches include wood chips, pine straw, or yard clippings. Barbara uses wood chips from pine, oak, cedar, and other trees cut down in her community that would otherwise go into the landfill. I call a local tree trimmer who's more than happy to bring mulch over for free, delivers it to my yard, and then I spread it all around. Since it is free, I have at least a four inch layer everywhere at all times. In addition to helping greatly with limiting the water usage, it also helps keep the weeds under control and really makes this yard very low maintenance. In the winter time is usually when I get my mulch and I kind of use it as my little workout every day. Spread, spend an hour or two spreading the mulch, walking around, looking at the plants and enjoying the nature. Another way Barbara conserves water in her garden is by cutting back on her watering during cooler months. Even St. Augustine grass only needs watering every eight to 14 days in the winter. Weaning plants off heavy irrigation can be more effective in the winter. During the cooler months in Florida, plants are basically semi-dormant, and especially if there's a frost and they lose their foliage, they're completely dormant, and this includes the grass. Their needs are just much less when it's cooler, there's not evaporation, the plants just are not using the water nearly as much. And so if we have a normal winter time of year, the plants really just don't need any water at all, even the grass. I'll watch the grass for signs of stress, and, and it rarely, if ever, develops it. Additionally, in the winter time, there's usually a little front that comes through about every seven to 10 days, and maybe if it just drops a half inch or an inch of rain, that's more than enough for the plants to use. Because she knows we are reaching the limit of the amount of fresh groundwater we should use, Barbara is glad she's changed her lifestyle. Doing this drought tolerant landscape gives me an overall good feeling of doing the right thing, plus the beauty and benefits have provided have far exceeded anything I ever imagined when I set out to do it. I highly recommend it. Not only can you decrease the amount of water you use outside your home and still have a beautiful landscape, you can also cut back on the amount of water you use on the inside of your home while maintaining a rich quality of life. Glenn Miller and Adele Simons live in a newly built home just outside Orlando and are quite serious about saving water on the inside of their home. When building their new home, Glenn and Adele's concerns about conserving Florida's natural resources played an important role in their choices. We've always wanted to have a Florida house um, from the Keys and there's, they have Key West style houses with the metal roof and the porch. And we found this book and it was called Florida Vernacular Architecture and it described a lot of the, the sort of the history of Florida houses. So we picked the Florida Cracker House as it's most, most people know it as. Our house is energy efficient um, from a perspective of the heat loads on the windows are blocked by the metal roof and the overhanging porches. So our air conditioner is actually smaller than necessary for a same size house that wasn't built with this architecture. Um, for water uh, efficiency, we, Luckily, a newer house, they have rules that you can only sell certain fixtures and such that, are, uh, that can only have a certain flow in them. And we bought very high quality fixtures so that we wouldn't have to go around and repair them every so often. Practicing good water management inside their home is important to Glenn and Adele, not only to save water, but to save them money. All of our water for the house comes from a well and we have equipment to chlorinate it and just soften it and such. So if we waste water, we're basically it adds up costs for us because there's electricity to pump it out of the ground and there's chlorine to chlorinate it and salt to uh, soften it. And the more water we use, the more it costs us. Using less water inside your home can be as easy as installing water efficient fixtures in your kitchen and bathroom. Older, inefficient shower heads use up to 10 gallons of water per minute. So taking a 15 minute shower can use as much as 150 gallons of water. Glenn and Adele's 2.5 gallon per minute shower heads are considered low flow and don't use nearly that much water. High efficiency shower heads are also available in 2.0, 1.5 and 1.2 gallons per minute. 
If you want to know how many gallons of water per minute your showerhead uses, look for the gallons per minute number printed on your showerhead. If your showerhead flows more than 2.5 gallons per minute, consider installing a more efficient showerhead. By taking five-minute showers, Glenn and Adele do even more to help preserve Florida's water supply. By using a shower timer, it's easy to tell when five minutes are up. Turning off the shower while lathering up your hair and body saves even more water. Many people unknowingly waste a lot of water in their homes when flushing the toilet. Inefficient, older model toilets use anywhere from three and a half to seven gallons of water every time you flush. In one day, that can add up to as much as 70 gallons of water for each person in your home just to flush the toilet. Glenn and Adele have chosen toilets for their home that use much less water, only 1.6 gallons per flush. Dual flush toilets are also available that use less than one gallon of water for liquid waste. To see how many gallons per flush your toilet uses, check your toilet for the number just behind the seat. If your toilet uses more than 1.6 gallons per flush, consider replacing it with a more efficient model. To conserve water at the sink, Glenn and Adele have aerators installed on all their faucets. Aerators mix water and air to create the feeling of high water flow. Faucets without aerators can flow up to seven gallons per minute. If your faucets run unrestricted, you don't have to replace your entire faucet, just install an aerator. Aerators come in different flow rates. In bathrooms, use a 1.5 gallon per minute aerator. In the kitchen, a 2.2 gallon per minute aerator works well. Make sure to buy an aerator that fits your brand of faucet. Economic and environmental benefits can also be seen by using water efficient appliances in your home. Adele has chosen an Energy Star front loading washing machine that uses less water than traditional top loaders. Older clothes washers use up to 48 gallons per load. Glenn and Adele's clothes washer uses only 14 gallons per load. Well, I made sure that I bought a washing machine that is particularly uh, designed so that it only allows the amount of water into the machine based on the weight of the clothing that's in there. So that Therefore, I'm not making the decision, the machine is, but at least it's deciding not to waste water. And the front loaders use less water because they have, there's less area for them, less volume for them to fill up. Because if you have a vertical bin, you have to fill it all the way up to make sure your clothes are um, covered. But when it's um, in the front loader, the bin rotates horizontally and so you only need you need much less water to, to get the clothes wet. Glenn and Adele have chosen a dishwasher that also saves water. Older dishwashers can use up to 20 gallons of water per cycle. Glenn and Adele's dishwasher uses only six and a half gallons of water per cycle. Our dishwasher is um, Energy Star and high efficiency um, and Adele and I don't use we don't use it unless it's completely full. That's the biggest water and energy savings. By adopting water-wise personal practices around their home, Glenn and Adele save additional water. Simply turning off faucets while brushing their teeth makes a big difference. We both use electric toothbrushes and it's got a two minute cycle. So if you're gonna, um, brush your teeth for two minutes, that's a lot of water to waste. A lot of people leave the water running when they brush their teeth, and we don't. We just wet the brush and turn it off, and then turn it back on to rinse. A slow dripping faucet like this one wastes 16 gallons of water a day, and over the course of a year, wastes almost 6,000 gallons of water. A running toilet can waste more than 200 gallons of water in a single day. Glenn realizes just how much water leaky fixtures can waste, so he's quick to notice when there's a problem. During the course of the day, if you notice, uh, if you hear a drip or you walk around in the house, you just keep an eye out for things like that. Also, the sound, I mean, if a toilet is still running or something, it didn't, the valve didn't close on it, um, then you sometimes, you, you keep your ears open for something like that. And so then you just stop it right away. 
By turning off the water while washing dishes in the sink, Adele keeps dishwater use at a minimum. When I'm washing dishes by hand, which I do sometimes, um, I get the soap on the sponge and I just soap everything up and put it in the, in the second sink. And then I turn the water on and rinse it all at once so that I'm not leaving the water running through the whole entire process. By using water inside their home with a conscientious hand, Glenn and Adele know they're doing their part to extend Florida's fresh water supply well into the future. Conservation is an important step that we can all take to extend our fresh groundwater supply. By following the tips highlighted in this program and by practicing water conservation as a way of life, we will most certainly make Florida's water our wealth for the future. This program is made possible by the following generous contributors. The American Water Works Association, Florida's authoritative resource on safe water. Orange County Utilities, preserving water, life's foundation. And by Orlando Utilities Commission, the reliable one. To share your feedback about this program or to order a copy of Florida's Water, Wealth for Our Future, plus additional programs in the Wildlife Matters series, please visit our website at www.naturewisetv.org. Wildlife Matters is created and produced by NatureWise Incorporated, dedicated to improving the environment through educational television and video.